Welcome everyone to the John Paul Memorial Lecture for 2022, Innovation in Land Conservation. This event is brought to you by Trust the Nature with support from the Paul Family Foundation. My name is Nikki Munro and I work at Trust the Nature here in the Northeast and I will be your host for this evening. This year, we are exploring the topic of two-way knowledge systems. Our lecture is titled Healthy Country, Bringing Together Different Ways of Knowing to Care for Country. Before we commence, I would first like to invite Uncle Dozer Atkinson to acknowledge the traditional owners here. Thank you, Dozer. Thanks, Nikki, for that, Unc. Um, yeah, I'd like to yeah, start off by um, um, offering a welcome to country for all those that are listening from Bangaran country. And uh, I'd like to um, pay my respects to um, Bangarang elders on the past, um, Bangarang elders of the present, and also the emerging Bangarang. Um, but I'd also like to extend that um, acknowledgement to uh, the traditional owners of all the um, other areas where people are tuning in from and also pay respects to their elders um, uh, from the past, the elders uh, from the, um, um, the present and sorry, and elders that are merging. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for that. Me. Thank you, Dozer. We're going to open the chat section of your screen for just a few minutes for you to all, for all our listeners to write in the country upon which you are sitting tonight, if you would care to write that down. Tonight's lecture is brought to you by Trust the Nature. Trust the Nature is one of a of Australia's oldest conservation organisations. It turns 50 this year. Our core business is working with willing landholders to protect nature on private land. We have now permanently protected over 100,000 hectares in Victoria and County. We received support from the Victorian government for our work, but we do rely on the generosity of donors to do what we do. This annual lecture series was established to recognise the impact of John Paul and his family. John was the former director of the Docker Plains Pastoral Company, who sadly passed away about seven years ago. John Paul worked with Trust for Nature to establish the largest conservation covenant in Victoria on his property, Docker Plains, on the Rambo, just down the road from Wangarad, where I'm speaking to you from here. The property is an outstanding example of balancing the protection of biodiversity with active farming. John was a passionate supporter of the local traditional owners and the Paul Family Foundation continues to provide ongoing support for the local Bangarang people. Thank you to very, very much to Mary and the Paul family for this lecture tonight. Over the next hour and a bit, we will hear from each of our guest speakers. There will be time for a short panel um, discussion at the end. So if you have any burning questions, please pop them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer your questions. Some will be answered during the night by our guest speakers on that Q&A section or some of our Trust for Nature staff. And a few of those questions will be put to our panellists at the end of the evening. Before I introduce you to our guest speakers, I want to give you some context. Australia has been cared for and shaped by Indigenous peoples over tens of thousands of years. Disruptions to that caring through colonial systems of oppression have resulted in catastrophic changes to the environment destruction of ecosystems and displacement of Indigenous peoples from their homelands. A shared responsibility of Indigenous peoples across the continent is to care for country, and that responsibility has in, in many ways been largely denied 
through contemporary land planning and management. This event asks, how do we care for country in contemporary Australia? And how might Western science embrace Indigenous knowledge as to achieve healthy country outcomes? Tonight, we will hear from three guest speakers. All are Indigenous people and all come with a wealth of experience and stories in trying to give Indigenous knowledges a voice. Tonight, we welcome Maddie Miller, Jack Pascoe and Doza Atkinson. I would first like to welcome Uncle Doza Atkinson. Uncle Doza is a Bangarang elder here in the Northeast and Doza recently set up the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Education um, Business. I, I hope we hear more about that. Doza, welcome. Sorry, I got a little bit of technical issues there, but yeah, back on back on board. So thank you very much for that um, introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, before I start um, sharing, uh, look, I'd also um, like to acknowledge um, John and Mary, um, you know, for their ongoing support. Um, uh, for us, for the Bangarang people, and um, look, John was a yeah a great ally for us. He he, he understood, um, you know, the politics around where we are today, and and uh, he he was a great supporter along with with Mary. Um, and I just before I do start uh, yarning, I, I want to uh, just share with you the, the picture in the background of my nephews and grandsons there is uh, actually um, out of Bontharampo. So that was the first time um, us as traditional owners had practiced um, our cultural burns on Bontharampo. So we, we owe that down in our regard and we're really stoked about uh about that and and our um mary played a big role along with trust for nature in in my, uh, making that become a reality for us um i'd like to start off you know boy um um saying that you know much of our uh, native vegetation you know was managed by um traditional owners using fire of course um along with other um tools for caring for country or other ways um you know fire was a tool for us that we um we used and it was uh you know it was noted by the um the early settlers the, and documented by the early settlers um as they came into onto bangaran country you know our our uh our, our country was park-like and and uh, the use of fire was used on a regular basis. Um, so, uh, you know, like all of our country right across um, Australia, you know, um, uh, the way we cared for country, fire was one of, as we know, was one of the main tools to, that uh, we used. Um, you know, and also, you know, fire was um, known to have been used amongst um, other things. Uh, we use it to make our country healthy by, you know, clearing the old grasses, scrub and um, un, um, unwanted woody um, regrowth. You know, um, it was used in the helping of new plants to grow and thrive, um, including edible plants and plants that in turn were food for a um, myriad of animals we needed, um, you know, so it was, it, it was part of the chain, it was a link in a long chain. Um, many of, that I just mentioned, many of the original Europeans often commented how lush and park-like our country was and how much evidence there, you know, was a burning, um, which is down to the knowledge, you know, and experience of the tradition of our, of the traditional owners um, and our burning methods. Um, 
you know, the use of fire was one of the main land, land management practices. Um, and the knowledge was based on a deep understanding of the landscape. You know, so we, we were part of that landscape. You know, um, we, knew, we knew that landscape, like we knew our family member or each other. And we knew how it fits um, on our country and came, you know, from thousands of years of application. So it was part, you know, it was passed on from generation to generation, the knowledge and, um, you know, the ways of uh, using fire to our advantage um, and to the country's advantage, of course. Um, always, you know, the, the use of fire was uh, overseen by elders um, and applied by um, initiated men of the Bangarang who learned through years of instruction by fire knowledge elders. You know, so this was uh, uh, the fire knowledge elders were, you know, passed on the knowledge from generation to generation and, and they became the teachers of, you know, of the fire and the carriers of the fire stick. Um, you know, today our country is unhealthy, as we all know, and is sick, with most areas dominated by introduced plants, many of which have become invasive um, within and along our waterways and natural bush areas. Over the um, more than 150 years since traditional owners were removed um, of country, off country, and um, our ability to care for country also ceased. Uh, many of our woodlands and forests were cleared and where they um, were able to regenerate, they grew back without care. Um, this has led to many cases of um, dense tree regrowth, especially where there are a few large old trees and very um, dense undergrowth rather than the original grassy park-like lands or the open woodlands. Um, more, you know, climate, we now, uh, there's a lot of talk around climate change now that increases, you know, the, the um, 70, um, 70 or droughts um, and coupled with heat waves, you know, is a recipe for disastrous wildfires, sorry, disastrous wildfires in these timbered areas, you know, like we've seen um, with the devastation in 2019-20, you know, them fires were uh, wildfires that were totally out of control, you know, and um, I, I know and I my, my personal thought is that if we um, are backed, uh, traditional owners are backed, um, and supported in reintroducing cultural burns um, to to these areas, um, the fire um, levels won't be as disastrous as what we've seen, you know, in the past. Um, many um, of the required. Um, um, sorry, I just lost me thought of thought there. Um, the cultural burns, yeah, they, they can help protect our country um, from the wildfires, as I said, by in increasing the openness of the tree canopies and reducing the amount of dead flammable uh, material or fuel, you know, that feeds these, these large bushfires. However, many of um, the ways required by traditional owners to, um, for us to re-revive cultural burning will need significant ongoing support from land managers you know, and the NRM agencies to trial and utilize the most suitable methods across various vegetation types and conditions. You know, we, we, um, we have a lot of experienced um, leaders within our communities now that uh, that have become a voice you know in the use of um, 
by and the reintroduction reintrodu of cultural burns. You know, and, and I think um, the way forward is um, for everybody, you know, it is to engage with the traditional owners in uh, in the reintroduction of cultural burns. You know, um, everybody, um, you know, we, we've heard, we've all heard of cool burns and we've all heard of ecological burns and, and, and whatever it may be. But, you know, I think when, when the traditional owners have a voice and are supported with that voice, it becomes a cultural burn, you know, because we we just don't burn um, to reduce um, the fuel that's that's a danger. We also burn um, as as a part of a big part of caring for country, you know. So, and the, our country tells us our country tells us when it's sick. It tells us when it's when it's time to burn, you know. So the times, you know, that you have to be able to read the country, and and um, you know, this is the knowledge part of the knowledge that's been passed down from generation to generation. And as I said, there's a lot of there's a lot of experienced people within the Koori communities or the Aboriginal communities that still hold this knowledge. Um, yeah. So um, we. Us as the Bangarang, you know, we're we're on a um a, a big a major learning curve ourselves. We've um, you know, we're starting to train up our our young um peoples to to uh to learn about fire, you know, to learn how to control fire, which which also opens the door for them to reconnect to their country, our country. And, and learn about our country because, um, you know, all that stuff, you know, it's all, it was all taken away from us during, you know, during the, during the early days. And, you know, I think the time has come now where for the benefit of all Australians, um, if we all walk together in caring for country and, and allowing, you know, the traditional owners to be a voice in caring for country, future generations, you know, will uh, definitely benefit from it. Um, because uh, I don't know about you, mob out there, but and I'm, I'm pretty sure you'd feel the same. You know, we ne would never ever want to see um, the disasters of 2019, um, 2019 and 2020 ever come back to. Uh, you know, to to haunt our future generations, and so, um, yeah. So, um, if anybody has any questions, as Nikki said, um, I'm willing to answer questions a, a bit later. But um, yeah, I just want to uh, finish off my my yarn and boy, uh, just um, reiterating re that. Uh, my um, um, acknowledgement and thanks go out to you know John Paul and 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 Mary Paul for their ongoing support in um, allowing us to um, be back on country, especially Bontherampo, because that that place is very significant to us as Bangarang people, and and uh, to be allowed to go back on there and start caring for country in a cultural way is. Is uh is something that we hold dearly to our hearts. Um, the the journey that they started um, um, with the Bangarang, we all know started a, a very very long time ago, but just as recent as our our elders, um, Uncle Sandy Atkinson and Uncle Freddie um, Dowling. Um, and, and and as well as other elders that uh, had started that journey with the Paul family, and hopefully that will go on for many years to come. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Doza. I've been unbelievably lucky over the last couple of months to have been able to do some burn training with Dozer and his family and the Dodoroa Dargle and um, 
it's been such an honour to do some training in, in burning and we're all hoping to be able to do a lot more burning on country. But it's been particularly exciting, um, Uncle Dozer, to see some of your the young people from your community coming out and doing burning as well. After all, who doesn't love a good bush burn? So, yes, a reminder that if there's any questions, please pop them in that Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Next, we have Jack Pascoe. Jack is a Ewan man with interest in fire ecology and biocultural landscapes. He's previously looked at the overlap in the diets of predators in the Blue Mountains um, and the effectiveness of fox control. He's radio tracked goannas and has been involved in the use of dogs to detect native species like quolls and introduce cats and foxes. He's currently the conservation and research manager at the Conservation Ecology Centre in the Otways. Welcome, Jack. Thanks, Nikki. I'll, um, just before I start, just like to thank Uncle Dozer for the, the welcome, for the extended welcome. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I'm on Gadabunut country where I have spent the vast majority of my life. Um, Gadabunut are the King Parrot speaking, uh, King Parrot uh, speaking people and one of the five language groups that make up the Ma Nation in Southwest Victoria. I'm going to do that thing where I try and share my screen now and it hopefully works. I'm going to assume, unless someone interjects, that you can see this, so I will keep on speaking. So, as Nikki pointed out, I, um, I work at an, organ a, an NGO called the Conservation Ecology Centre, um, where I'm the uh, manager of the research and land management program there. I also work as a research fellow at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my experience working um, in Gadabunut country on Cape Otway over the last decade or so. Um, so uh, this is the caravan that I spent um, the first three years of my life in, um, going back and forth from Melbourne whilst my parents built a house on, on Cape Otway. Um, I'm not showing you this particularly because I think you care where I spent the first three years of my life, but largely because I wanted to see what sort of, wanted to show you what sort of country it is. So. You can see that the uh, the beautiful manor gum standing above an extraordinarily open understory, uh, very few shrubs. Um, the majority of the plants that you can see around the caravan, kangaroo grass, uh, lamandra longifolia, a, a weaving grass for the local mobs, um, and a little bit of bracken, but very little, very few shrubs. And um, again, I got mullet when I was a kid, pushing that little mower around. Um, it was pretty extraordinary. Again, not expecting you to care, just wanted to show a, a, a close up of the open grassy woodlands that, uh, uh, that I grew up in. Uh, again, and that beautiful golden color of the femina heads, seed heads, um, and you look through more lamandra, um, a little bit of uh, sweet passeria creeping through, which is that orange. I appreciate it. it's a pretty, uh, pretty old photo, so it's a bit pixelated, but um, you get the idea. Um, Around about 2002, I left, um, I left this bit of country and went to study in the University in Melbourne and then uh, eventually in Western Sydney. And uh, I eventually returned to the country in around about 2012. Um, and, uh, and, and the joint had really turned on its head, unfortunately. So all the, the managums largely that I'd grown up uh, walking underneath had died. And you can see that the scrub underneath is 100% cover, incredibly thick, impossible to walk through. Um, a couple of things had happened. Old Gumbawa, the koala, um, had, had built up an extraordinary large population, having been released um, in 1981 on Cape Otway, or reintroduced back in the Otways. Um, 75 individuals had slowly eaten their way, or quite rapidly towards the end, eaten their way through the canopy of the vast majority of managums on Cape Otway. Um, I just put a couple of graphs into my slides to prove that I'm a scientist, but I'm not going to speak to them other than to say that uh, the reason that managums are so uh, highly prized by koalas and cause some of these overabundance issues is uh, the high levels of digestible uh, proteins and the leaves and the um, low levels of, uh, of toxins and terpenes that restrict uh, the digestion of those, um, of those proteins. Um, so this is where we were at. 
no canopy, an extremely thick understory um, that uh, traditional traditional fire knowledge holders will talk of as upside down country with all leaves on the bottom and the roots in the air. Um, I thought it was time to consider uh, fire. I couldn't see a way forward without um, some sort of intervention for this country. It was sick and we were losing our plant diversity really rapidly. I thought that fire would be an opportunity to remove some of the mid-story and encourage a germination of another generation of trees. Uh, I reached out to a, a couple of the firefighting agencies in the region and eventually uh, the Country Fire Authority um, was interested in um, getting involved with, with what we were doing. They were interested in a uh, completely different reason than I was. They were interested in managing fine fuels, uh, surface, near surface and elevated fuels in particular because this landscape we're looking at um, had quite a lot of... Uh, Human uh, habitation, lots of lots of houses in amongst this country that were extraordinarily flammable. Um, so this is me looking real deadly at my first fire, um, knowing absolutely not a thing about what I was doing. But these were the some of the stringy bark woodlands that were still left in and amongst the uh, the managums that we'd lost. Um, I was hoping still for, that these fires uh, led by the CFA would. Um, encourage germination managums but it, it didn't happen and, and that's that's been pretty much the case with uh other areas that have lost their managums in sand country and this is all sand country because uh, uh the seed bank seems to um, deplete relatively quickly after seed set so um we busted our backs and we, we planted a whole stack of of trees i think 140 odd thousand trees over i don't know how many hectares anymore but to try and replace these forests and we were doing that with the local local trees. So Messamate, Manigum, Casuarina and Blackwoods with the, with the canopy trees that I'd grown up underneath. Um, and we, we had some reasonably good results. So we were looking to reduce some of the, the density of the mid-story, um, thin out the bracken uh, and protect the canopy from future bushfires. Um, you can see here we've, um, we've done perfectly in terms of what the CFA were after, removing mid-story fuels, uh, tightening up the bark fuels up on the stringy barks um, and opening up the, the fine fuels on the uh, on the ground to reduce the spread. Um, six months later, you'd almost not know that we'd been there. Um, it had greened up lots of beautiful plants coming through in the understory as the tussock had opened and the, and the bracket had been thinned out. Um, some more graphs, basically to show you that we had done what the CFA were hoping we'd done. We'd reduced um, the levels of elevated fine fuels. Um, we've tightened up bark fuels and we had opened up uh, the understory um, and, and measured in tonnes per hectare. And these are all wonderful things for firefighters because they reduce the ability of fires to spread uh, um, in, in summer and also reduce the intensity that fires will burn at. But that's not what I was interested in. I was, I was an ecologist and I was very interested to see whether or not we were going to do any harm to the, the native flora and whether or not we could, in fact, improve things. And we were able to show that in both Messmate and Managum country, we were able to increase the number of native herbs germinating in the understory. We weren't having an impact on the number of native shrubs uh, that were present, but we were feeding them out and reducing the intensity of those shrubs across the landscape. So we were winning. But we, were, we uh, unleashed some awful monsters of things occasionally. Um, and uh, when, when conditions were, were right or conditions were wrong for these conditions, uh, for these types of fires, um, we had some you know, effectively controlled wildfires that we were, we were maintaining with fuel breaks. Um, they were scorching uh, canopies of, of the remaining managums, which um, is not good for their health or their, their viability. Um, and obviously this does you know, damage to the soils, particularly in this sandy country where the soils can, the stands can really heat up quite a lot. Um, I didn't know a lot about fire a decade ago, other than what I'd been taught through my agency training. But I could sense that this wasn't the way that we wanted to move in the future. I was really lucky to also have other mentors, you and elders, but other elders from around the country that had shared bits and pieces with me, not just about fire, but for caring for country and uh, respecting country it was as much as the lessons of import that, that I received from, from some of these old fathers. Um, and from that knowledge, we were able to introduce a different sort of fire in the Cape Otway. So you can see this 
lovely low fire that, that's trickling through the undergrowth of, of the intact uh, manor gums uh, and, and messmates on Cape Otway. And we've been able to introduce this sort of fire now right across and let the fire uh, right across that bit of um, bit of woodland and let the fire choose where it needs to go. It chooses the, the grasses that are ready to, to burn and, and travels through the understory. Um, the obligatory shot just proves that I do occasionally leave this armchair. And uh, I, I share this photo because it just shows that with um, uh, a small amount of grass fuels on the ground, um, you can interrupt the cycle of the shrub domination. So with this small, maybe foot high flame, we're able to reduce the spread of, um, of this plant, which is uh, coast beard heath, which has been creeping in from the coast over the last couple of decades and making the, the understory extraordinarily thick, knocking out understory plants and, and making the country incredibly different to what it was when I was a child. So you, you can do it. Uh, with, with very small fire intensities, um, if, as long as the country hasn't gone too far. And we're able to encourage so many beautiful plants of, of cultural significance uh, to come back through the, um, through the grassy understory, just like in, in, um, in, in fires that you would see in grasslands or on the volcanic plains, for instance. Um, bullbine lilies and vanilla lilies, which are, have a tuberous, um, a tuber under the ground, which um, is for food and, and kangaroo grass, and also um, reinvigorates the lamandra, which is a, a weaving grass. Just also, um, this is just a fire to prove how deadly we can get. You can see the unburnt patches. We're actually burning around the seedling trees there, which is um, obviously we need to be able to do, um, but the, the trees need to be big enough to take fire. So we actually need to walk the fire around these seedlings in order, order to do it. And finally, I wanted to share some of the thoughts and, and the works that we're working towards with um, the local Mara community as they develop their um, uh, cultural fire program across their territories. Um, one of the things that we're, we're looking at is working with um, uh, the, the pollen record. So uh, my colleague from the University of Melbourne, Michael Sean Fletcher, was able to show in Tasmania um, that um, button grass plains that um, are, are so prevalent in the high country of Tasmania are actually uh, artifacts and, and are there through um, the use of fire by the Palawa people um, uh, to push back on the rainforest to ensure that there is food and, and resources for them to be consistent um, when they need them. He was able to show that by taking sediment cores and, and measuring both um, pollen species and charcoal. We're working with the Ma to do a really similar thing. So um, in Driot Nature Conservation uh, Reserve, um, near Mount Warrion in between Lake Kalakalak and Karangalite. Um, we've shown a, a really interesting trend, which is, is repeated right across Southeast Australia, particularly in grasslands, where uh, the decreasing amount of charcoal representing fire in the sediment um, is also um, consistent with a decreasing amount of poaceae, so the poa or the grass species, um, whilst European weeds and, and shrubby species have really increased. Um, and that um, that is an indication that the country is turning on its head, going from open and grassy to more shrub dominated and, and flammable. Um, and a shot of my family watching the smoke, and that's where I'll leave it for tonight. But thank you for having me. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Deb. I I always say I think that a picture tells a thousand words, and you've got some fantastic pictures there. How did you get an aerial shot of down on those small, the birds going around the thing? I presume you had a little drone. I was surprised it could see through the smoke. That was fantastic. There wasn't a lot of smoke. That's the point, I guess, Nikki. <laughs> and yes, someone cleverer than I was operating a drone. Fantastic. I love that concept of upside down country too, where the leaves are on the bottom and the roots are on the top. <laughs> that tells it all, doesn't it? Um, a reminder, put your Q&As in. Some people are doing that. That's wonderful. Another small reminder, actually, in the chat section, something I was supposed to have said before but forgot, There's um, we popped a Vimeo link, a link to a film that Uncle Dozer has been um, instrumental in creating. It's a film called Bidjawaka about burning in the northeast. So, we strongly invite you all to have a look at that link, the Vimeo, that's, the link is there in the chat. Um, I would now like to invite Maddie Miller 
to present. Maddie is a Dharug woman whose research looks at ways of knowing country. She's an archaeologist and an artist and a weaver of knowledge, bringing non-Indigenous and Indigenous sciences together to understand and care for country. She's currently a research fellow in the Ecological Knowledges of Country at Melbourne Uni and Maddie's is a voice that is growing louder and I'm very honoured to have her speak with us tonight. Welcome, Maddie. Oh, I just shared my screen and tried to unmute at the same time. That was a harrowing experience, but um, here I am. Thank you so much for having me, Nikki, and thank you to Uncle Dozer for your welcome and your talk and, and Jack as well. Uh, like Nikki said, my name's Maddie Miller. I'm a Darug woman. Uh, so my ancestral lands are uh, from sort of Sydney up to the Blue Mountains and particularly around the Hawkesbury River. Uh, I also have ancestry uh, from uh, migrants who came here for the gold rush, uh, migrants who came to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and um, also, oh, and apologies if my my dog barks in the background. Um, I am a research fellow at the University of Melbourne and I work with the Arthur Ryler Institute. Uh, and primarily my fellowship is looking at ways of bringing together uh, Indigenous science and Western science. Let's see if we can get this. There we go. Um, so I'm joining you tonight from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country. Uh, we, uh, I guess it's, it's somewhere that I've lived for most of my life uh, and somewhere that has kept me safe. And so I want to say, um, you know, that I, I acknowledge the um, elders of the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri, both, both past and present, uh, and acknowledge country. Um, this is one of my favourite times of year on Wurundjeri country, and maybe a few people might disagree with me, but it's it's my favourite time of year because one of my favourite animals is is very active, and that's the magpie. Uh, today I, I walked alongside a magpie for quite a while who had a big worm in his mouth and was eyeing me off. Um, and maybe I'm lucky I don't, I've never been swooped, uh, so maybe my magpie experience is, is slightly different to other people's. So I guess tonight I'm going to briefly be sort of talking about country uh, and about our, um, you know, uh, how, how we perceive country uh, and a little bit about bringing knowledges together. So when, when we as Aboriginal people and Uncle Dozer and Jack both spoke about country, but when we talk about country, we're talking about our homelands of places created by ancestral beings and cared for through perhaps 3,000 generations. And I say perhaps because I'm an archaeologist and uh, the sort of depths of, of occupation here on this continent scientifically from a Western scientific point of view are uh, really only understood uh, through the skills of an archaeologist and the abil our ability to date. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if, in fact, that 3,000 generations of caring is much longer. And when we talk about country, we talk about the stories that have passed down through those thousands of generations and the intimate ways uh, we as people are connected to country. Often elders will say that the health of community is dependent on the health of country. And that also stands in the reverse, that country needs us to be healthy because country needs people. And so I'll just be talking tonight sort of in general terms of country. And I really enjoyed that Jack and Dozer both spoke about a particular part of country. Um, but I wanted to talk more broadly about you know, I'm just, <laughs> one second, I'm just going to go close my door.
sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but tonight I'll be, yeah, so I want to talk in general terms about, uh, about country and the broad ways in which this place, um, this continent really, is an entirely anthropogenic environment. Uh, but I'm really glad that people put in the chat today uh, what country they're on and or they're traveling to. I noticed a few people were saying that uh, and I really urge everybody to get to know the country that you spend time on, to pay attention to the changing of the seasons, not the four seasons, but the seasons of that country, um, to look for the connections between plants and animals and people. And I suspect maybe if you're an avid gardener or somebody who spends a lot of time outdoors, which I'm sure most of you are, um, that might be something that you already do, but maybe don't connect it to that beating heart of country, that enduring legacy of deep time. Uh, and also to take up that call for action that is caring for country. So I wanted to also frame everything that, that I'm saying tonight and that Jack and Uncle Dozer have already said, uh, what we're advocate, advocating for, what we're talking about, it's, it is a human rights issue. And I also, and this is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which I encourage everybody to read. Um, but I also wanted to highlight that not only is it our right as Indigenous peoples to maintain, our traditional, our traditional knowledge and expressions, but also to develop it. Indigenous cultures on this continent have never been and will never be stagnant. They evolve and adapt. adapt. Our cultures have survived the ice age. They have survived sea level rise that swallowed country between Victoria and Tasmania. We have witnessed the drying of lake systems and volcanic eruptions. And stories of these events, and some of these events took thousands of years, uh, carried down through generations. And so now too, I guess, you know, will the stories of the present, the stories of colonisation, the stories of the stolen generations, and of the immense and often intentional harm to country, the stories of resilience, of cultural revival and survival, and I hope stories of healing. So I guess <laughs> um, in the tradition of, of, of what Jack just said, I thought we'll start with something personal. But the first time I truly understood that country was unhealthy was in 2009. I was 17 and I had just started my last year of high school. And at that time, all I really cared about was studying and bumming lifts off friends so that I could avoid the bus in the morning uh, and uh, it was a Saturday in February and I received a text message from a girlfriend that said there's a fire don't worry it's ages away p.s what are you wearing tonight do you have anything I can borrow uh, and that fire of course became something else entirely it was a ferocious beast that tore through country, taking with it friends and community members who were constant figures on the mountain. And I remember distinctly the smell of eucalyptus in the air as we evacuated. The back fence was already in flames. And these trees, um, and these are pictures of my backyard. Um, the, you know, these trees hadn't seen fire in well over 50 years and they hadn't seen a healing fire in much, much longer. Uh, and the months that followed, uh, and this is perhaps three weeks after the fire, so the months that followed the fire were bleak. Uh, that epicomic growth that was promised took months to appear, uh, and when it did, it really became a symbol of hope and rebirth, uh, but still today when I travel back home where my parents that still live here um, and I travel up that mountain the uh, skeletons of, of mountain ash still stand starkly across country uh, almost as as gravestones so you know we know country is unhealthy 
we know we're seeing rapid biodiversity loss. We know our ecosystems are collapsing. And we know that this endangers us, endangers us all from our drinking water to food av availability to risk of life due to catastrophic wildfire to flood to heat to unclean air and I I, I mean I maybe I'm preaching to the converted and I don't need to harp on about this because this audience will know all of this uh, very well however this loss and this unhealthy country I rarely see it expressed in ways that honour the interconnectedness of all things through an Indigenous lens. Uh, and Indigenous knowledge systems, you know, when I talk about an Indigenous lens or Indigenous knowledge, um, you know, I'm sort of, uh, I guess Indigenous knowledge systems are something that is, they are dynamic and they're holistic. Uh, they, um, uh, incorporate things like governance, social relationships, economy, family institutions, language, naming and classification systems, access to and uses of resources, ritual, spirituality, and worldviews. And it is through practice that this knowledge is transmitted across generations through practice and story and law. And we consider that our knowledge comes from country our ancestors and the ancestral beings that are still present and embedded in country. Uh, and that's also something that um, gives me a lot of hope as a person whose family has been disconnected from country for a long time and whose country has been urbanised is that country holds knowledge for us. Uh, and so nothing is, is truly lost. Um, we part of that is, is this kinship relationship that connects us as a network of people, plants and animals and the landscape. Um, and I think increasingly I'm seeing uh, that, that this want to incorporate Indigenous knowledge into research um, and in practice, but there are a number of issues that arise from that. And the first being that the view that Indigenous knowledge must be validated by Western science. And this really implies that Indigenous knowledge is lesser than other forms of knowledge and fails to recognise that Indigenous knowledge is built on tens, and tens of thousands of years of place-based observation uh, and, you know, you, uh, really intricate social dynamics. And often Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous peoples we're seen as, as add-ons to existing researchers, not, not necessarily equal partners or as integral to the work, uh, but work that would happen irregardless of the inclusion of Indigenous knowledge. So when we do research or practice in a way that is equitable, in so how, you know, how do we do that in a way that respects both streams of knowledge, uh, in my experience, this interest in, the, in this work goes both ways. I work with communities uh, predominantly in the Southeast and a common thread that uh, I see is an interest in looking for ways to bring together multiple forms of knowledge, that this extension of goodwill from traditional owners to Western science exists uh, looking for ways in which we can work together to heal country. Um, and so the research I do is really about looking for uh, the mechanisms for bringing together these ways of knowing. However, uh, I do feel um, maybe, and this goes without saying, that there's knowledge and then there's ingrained prejudice that hinders this cross knowledge understanding. Uh, and the one that is fairly pervasive um, and that I come across a lot in conservation and um, ecology is the myth of wilderness or this foundation of understanding country or nature as a wilderness. And this pervasive myth dismisses thousands of years of care 
uh, and also 200 odd years of complex occupation. And this fuels the narrative of an empty landscape of terra nullius, of our people not being uh, complex custodians of country, but, you know, bumbling through it. Uh, and really our ancestors did not live on the edges of country, um, but they are, and we are, country manifest as human and as spirit. And to dismiss humans as a keystone species, I think, is a, is a grave error. Uh, as an archaeologist, uh, I'm trained to see the hand of humans in the landscape and to understand how human action shapes country. And so I think it's an it's a interesting marriage coming into ecology as an archaeologist. But my frustrations in archaeology was that we were only looking for the obvious manipulations of country or the obvious material remains uh, and missing the broader picture. Uh, and ecology perhaps looks at uh, nature and not people. And so um, I think for me, it, 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 is, a, it is a nice fit. Um, so I guess from an archaeological perspective, I just wanted to highlight some research by Professor Susan Lawrence uh, and, the, and her collaborators at La Trobe University. Uh, and she, her research shows the impacts of the gold rush far exceed the extent of the gold fields. Sludge, the runoff of sluicing activities, flowed downstream covering vast expanses of country in sometimes meters of sediment and uh, you can see this is um, south of Ballarat and this waterway and and basically from where the dog's standing to the waterway is completely covered in sludge uh, and this was something that was fairly well reported in the newspapers at the time pastoralists complaining about the sludge and um, you know sometimes hundreds of kilometres away from the source of the sludge. Uh, but it, it is something that's quickly dropped from memory, um, from the collective memory of society. And this is really in stark contrast to me to the, you know, 30,000-year-old stories from Gunditch Mara that speak of a time in which the land was engulfed after a volcanic eruption. Uh, you know, I think... Um, and that's that's the story of Budge Bim, and I'd encourage everybody who hasn't been there to to visit um, Budge Bim. Uh, there's a new cafe that is selling smoked deal. Um, if that's any <laughs> enticement, uh, you know. And so I guess what's what's important here is in that forgetting, you know, in that very short time between the gold rush and now, in comparison to the thirty thousand year story, and that's a story that's been passed down over over, you know, far over a thousand generations, something like 1,200 generations. Uh, so in forgetting that story from the gold rush, which is, you know, not that long ago, uh, we as humans forget our responsibilities to country and we forget that our actions have impacts and that the law of this land is to take responsibility for those actions and to learn from those mistakes uh, and the forgetting fuels the myth making of an in untouched environment and also just as a sort of a side note from an archaeological perspective uh, that meant this work by Susan Lawrence and co has really changed the way in which archaeology needs to be done so previously we may have excavated maybe a metre down and not found anything and said well there's no evidence here of aboriginal occupation however that occupation is capped sometimes two three four meters below this sludge uh, and so in fact we have really excellent intact deposits um, but in that forgetting we have recreated history for Jar Jar Wadarung and other uh, affected mob uh, in a way that is detrimental for their ability to care for their cultural sites. 
Uh, another piece of research, and we've, we've already mentioned this fella tonight, um, but University of Melbourne geographer and we're a dream man, Associate Professor Michael Sean Fletcher, amongst others, have, have tracked this occurrence of catastrophic wildfire in Tasmania in the southeast of Australia, um, as well as looking at change over time. And this research shows a number of things uh, that country was managed in sophisticated ways for millennia and managed is a terrible word, um, but it was cared for in sophisticated ways for millennia uh, and that the abrupt disruption of care has led to catastrophic outcomes uh, and also massively cha a massively changed environment. Uh, so this idea of a Tasmanian wilderness is uh, incredibly damaging because it's it's not um, it's not a wilderness. It's a anthropogenic landscape. Uh, so humans, and, and I guess what this what this shows is that humans continue to impact country. Uh, sometimes through doing nothing, we do a lot, uh, but also through forestry and extraction, um, planned burns like Jack showed. Uh, but also the decisions to invite and discourage people to be present on country, like Uncle Dozer spoke about, um, you know, being given permission to return to country to undertake cultural caring responsibilities. So I guess um, what I wanted to express using these examples and there is, countless other examples in every single landscape uh, is really the extent to which Australia is an anthropogenic landscape, that the layers of this country are filled with traces of humans, our hands are on everything. And as I sort of said before, my research at Uni Melb with ARI, um, I'm interested in bringing together ways of, of knowing, um, weaving together Indigenous knowledge and Western science to find innovative ways to care for country. And I think that we really do need to start by coming together to understand the role of people in ecosystems and landscapes in, in a caring capacity. I just wanted to include this picture. This is um, <laughs> my parents property as my mother and I were uh, undertaking a cool burn and so you can see the the smoke uh, and to see smoke in that landscape and smile uh, was a real healing moment for me uh, and so my uh, research is really just getting started and um, maybe I'm just fishing for an invitation to come back um to tell you how it goes uh but I wanted to end with um this quote that you've already seen from Wurundjeri and this you know to me is um really important that that Wurundjeri consider the natural world as also a cultural world and so if we stop separating nature and culture how do we then consider place? How do we consider country? Uh, and I think that is the foundational work that we all need to do in coming together to uh, heal country, to bring together all these different ways of knowing. Um, and I think for me, that is that is the future. And so I'll I'll leave it there. Um, and I'll stop sharing if I can figure that out. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Maddie. I've often wondered with the term wilderness, this either needs a whole new definition or whether, yes, we have a whole different word for our landscapes for what we currently call wilderness. Thank you. I, before we get to a while, everybody's thinking of their Q&A questions. We're getting them in thick and fast. So thank you, everybody. I'd like to invite Jai Atkinson, proud Bangalang woman, to explain our 
artwork, which was done by local Bangarang artist, Beck Atkinson. Thank you, Jai. Thanks, Nikki. Hope you all can hear me well enough. Um, I'm reading um, the words of um, Rebecca Atkinson, who is our um, Bangarang artist who created this artwork for the John Paul Memorial Lecture Series today. Um, so hopefully I can I can do Beth justice. Okay, so uh, Beck, Beck says that the lower circle design is to showcase the engagement and support of cultural heritage from different organisations and people as well. The middle section is representing traditional fire burning to continue our caring and connection to our lands and culture. The tree on either side is a huge part in our cultural heritage as they once and are still practicing making artifacts, which tells the story of our journey in life. The middle section is the Ovens River, which is part of the Wangaratta region and once a great provider for our people. So Rebecca Atkinson is a proud Maradju Bangarang Kerup, Kerupmara Gunditjmara artist. Um, she is based in Shepparton um, and uh, I wish she could be here to tell you a bit more about her artwork, but I ho hopefully I've, I've given you a good insight. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you very much, Di, and thank you so much to Rebecca too for this absolutely amazing artwork. We're so honoured to have it. Well, I just have a few more words while you're getting your Q&As in. Here at Trust for Nature, we had some big changes in the space of traditional owner engagement and reconciliation over the past few years. Um, starting in 2017, Trust for Nature started on a journey with Reconciliation Australia's guidelines. Um, we completed a Reflect Reconciliation Action Plan, a Reflect Wrap, last year. And this year we're working on the next process, Innovate Wrap. Here in Northeast Victoria, we have employed our first cultural liaison officer for Trust for Nature. Um, we have currently had cultural training for our Northeast team, and this is now going to be rolled out to all of Trust for Nature staff. Jai, who just spoke, is our cultural liaison officer, and she has helped to develop protocols for recognising and managing artefacts on private land and has been instrumental in liaising between our TFN team and local traditional groups. The Port Phillip TFN team have coordinated a traditional owners conservation and land management course for two years now. And a recent graduate, Chelsea, is now a conservation officer in Karangamite. And just, I think it was just last week, she's been voted in Curry Student of the Year, which is just wonderful. We've also begun the process to transfer land management and ownership of some land to traditional owners. So an eight hectare property at Phillip Island will be returned to the Bunurong people. And Ned's Corner Station in the far northwest of Victoria will be returned to the first peoples of the Miller Mallee. Trust for Nature has indigenous engagement and interests embedded in our strategy and our business plan. And this is just the start of Trust for Nature's reconciliation process. So I invite you, our listeners, to ask our panel a few questions. Um, if you have a question, type it in the Q&A. We've got a few already. So I'm being handed my first question. There are so many amazing and important cultural practices. Why is fire and cultural burning highlighted so often? And what other practices should we be mindful of? Who would like to answer this one or start with this one? Why fire? Mm. 
Doza, do you have anything to say to that one? Yeah, look, I think um, why fire is because it's been used um, as a tool to care for our country since the beginning of time. You, you know, uh, fire has just uh, became um, a part of what our what our country is. You know, so fire is definitely um, along with other tools, and you know, the other tools, of course, is uh, you know the manipulation of uh, um, the waterways to reduce you know overgrowth of uh, certain plants and that in around our wetlands you know, you know all these practices were were carried out by the tra our traditional owners in the in the past but yeah the best I could answer is why fire is is, is that uh, our ancestors mastered the use of fire and um, it became part of what our country um, is today you know and it's it should be reintroduced uh, um, from a cultural um, aspect. Yeah. So I hope I answered that question, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think a lot of us Westerners have learnt to fear fire and you guys learnt to harness it. It's quite a different approach, isn't it? Jack or Maddie, did you have anything to say? in addition to that question. I think, um, I think Young's really done it justice. I mean, we, we do know that the way we managed, you know, there were other ways in which the country was managed, you know, deliberate watering of country at different times of the year, but, you know, also the turning of the soil when, when foods were harvested obviously had a huge impact on, you know, nutrient cycling and, and things like that. Um, but I, I think fire is, is probably the one thing that um, has really shaped country. And so its absence, its deliberate removal is what, you know, I mean, you could argue that the changing the watering has also made a massive difference to country, but um, the, the absence of fire, which is a deliberate choice and our suppression over the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years has been quite spectacular. We're quite good at it, um, has made such an impact on country. And so uh, we talk a lot about bringing fire back to try and, um, you know, bring country back the way it should be. Thank you. We're getting a lot of messages in to say lots of positive comments on the beautiful artwork. Thank you for all of those. Much appreciated. I'd like to hear from each of you, maybe Maddie first, because I haven't. You haven't answered one yet. If you had a magic boomerang <laughs> or message stick or something and could grant three wishes to help your country, what would you wish for? Ooh. Um, I guess, you know, I don't think there is a necessarily a magic uh, way to heal country. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard elders talk about this is a multi-generational task that we have before us. And um, I wouldn't want a magic way to heal country because that work is important, that doing is important, and that's part of the healing. Uh, I guess if I could change the system now, what would I change? And I think it would be... Uh, those barriers for getting people on country that people like Uncle Dozer shouldn't have to say thank you for being allowed on country that that should just be the norm um, and that uh, that healing work of of fire and water and planting and clearing and and doing all of those things is something that everybody does um, and that that you know we have that opportunity to pass down that knowledge and build up that knowledge uh, and so I guess that's 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 my magic is is uh, let's do the work together Jack would you have three wishes <clears throat> um I might wave the wand a little bit to speed things up Maddie I think um 
Look, I, I think what I would really there's there's we talk, you know, there's only so many landscapes where cultural burning can be applied at the moment because of the the the, the damage that's been done or or the removal of, of cultural fire right fire from country. Um, it would be nice for that first bit of intervention to be easier. Um, it's there's no easy way of doing it. Often it needs to be mechanical, or we need to use a hot fire to reset country, and you know that does its own damage. I would like to be able to. Uh, skip that bit if I could, because that'll be my three wishes. I look, I as, and Maddie alluded to it, um, having country more accessible to its people, um, it should be a no-brainer, but it's difficult, um, and it shouldn't be. So there you go. I'll have two wishes. Thanks, Nikki. Do you have any extra wishes? Hmm. Uh, look, I think um, Maddie and Jack have yeah have, have hit the nail on the head. But uh, just to just to add to what they said, I, my wish would it would be that it's um, you know the uh, the sharing of knowledge is allowed to move deeper into community. So introduced into our schools, you know, introduced into um, our, our whatever it be, our TAFEs or our colleges or whatever it be, where the you know traditional owners have the opportunity to get into the into them sort of circles and share the knowledge, which which will allow that walking together um, to your country more accessible, you know. And uh, probably another wish would be that. Uh, you know that the powers that be that do control areas now that do um, that are regularly burnt or regularly that um, the introduction of um, curry knowledge into them circles is uh, not taken for granted, but you know upheld and accepted. Yeah, so. Thanks, Dozer. I might continue with you, Dozer, and ask each of your questions. But my question is, what do you think is actually the greatest blockage to getting more people like yourselves burning on country? Is it, or even having a, a greater effective Aboriginal voice in land management? What's the greatest blockage? Is it, is it our systems, our yeah. uh, public support, money? What do you think? Uh, yeah, look, many there's many um, reasons why, but you know the <laughs> you know the one of the one of the main reasons I suppose that I could I could think of off the top of my head is uh, fear. You know, I think fear is 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 one of the big obstacles that we've got to get across. So uh, people are, you know, organisations are very fearful of letting. The Koori or the you know Aboriginal mob lead the conversation or lead the burn or you know lead the knowledge sharing. So there's that fear factor there. That's that's a, a, a you know a big hindrance. But you know also the 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 funding funding's not you know not set up to support. Uh, you know, like you mentioned before, we we went through our training. You know, we've got all the right certificates to go out and perform and to to be on country. But uh, you know, I think there's not enough funding opportunities for us to further that. You know, further that learning and to to uh, apply that learning to our youth coming through. You know, so. Yeah, getting insurance was was definitely another thing. Yeah, Jack, what do you find? Do you have any extra blockages in addition to that? Uh no, I reckon that's you know that that's why it is. I mean, I, I was a pretty unusual circumstance because I came up through the CFA, and it's easy to do it through the agencies, right? Bloody easy. Um, 
and then I, I guess I, I I didn't want to do it like that, so I, I went and learnt, and you know I had it demonstrated to me in other places, and then I just had to take a real big deep breath and go out in the bush and drop a match and uh, hope that I didn't know as much as I thought I did, and I didn't, but I didn't bugger it up completely, Nikki. Um, but you know, like it probably shouldn't rely on people taking. You know, I was on private land, so I could do it legally, although the liability would have been all mine had it gone badly. Um, and so I, I did it discreetly to begin with. But, you know, I probably shouldn't have to be that way for the mob and, um, you know, to take all the risk because, it, you know, there's fences and there's infrastructure and, and that doesn't accord with the way fires were, were lit traditionally. They would, they would, we would know where they were going out and that would be based on where the vegetation was and, and where the country needed to go. And if there's a house in the middle of that, that's a that's an artefact that our new fire practices need to account for, right? So there's things that can go wrong. Um, you know, you and people are, are, are doing more and more fire practice across their territories and that, that that's wonderful and finding different avenues to do it. But it should be more straightforward, particularly on public land, Nikki. Actually, while we're talking about that, Jack, would you mind just explaining to our listeners very briefly what the difference is between burning on public land to private land and what the the legal systems behind it and the permissions behind that? Are you able to briefly explain that? Uh I, I won't. I'm not going to go to the legislation, Nikki, because it takes me a little while and it's 17 minutes past eight o'clock, so my brain's probably not there at the moment. But um, look, I, I guess really on private property um, in most councils, you can burn on private land with the consent of the landowner or by the landowner, and, and that's fine as long as you don't bugger it up, I guess. Um, it, in public land, it's agency-led, um, and that changes you know, but largely that, that's managed by Forest Fire Management Victoria. Um, and I guess the difference is in some, in some countries where there are agreements, say, through the Traditional Land Settlement Act for co-management and things like that, that that's where it is. Um, there's probably more of a role for, for mob in, in public land, but not my expertise exactly. No, but we all have to try to deal with it still, don't we? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Maddie, are you able to speak to that same question, but more in a bigger, bigger than fire? Like how do, what is the greatest blockage to having Indigenous voice heard? Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, what, what both Jack and Uncle Dozer touched on around uh, accessibility to country is really important. I'm thinking of a scar tree near me that took Wurundjeri um, months, maybe up to 12 months to get a, an approval to be able to make that scar, uh, to make the, the canoe. Um, and that permit came with conditions around needing a cherry picker and all sorts of, of cost prohibitive, uh, you know, things associated with that. Um, and so, you know, just simple things like practicing culture become, really difficult and uh, even just going having that process is a deterrent to actually applying for it uh, and I think we as a broader society are poorer for not having culture practice on public land where it's accessible to everybody uh, uh, I guess there's, there's many many blockages uh, a lot of legislation hasn't kept up with perhaps the goodwill of many of the people that we work with. Uh, and so uh, that becomes a bit of a scapegoat for inaction. Uh, but, you know, I think we in Victoria, you know, we're looking at treaty, whatever that looks like. Um, we're looking at land use agreements. We're looking at other ways of doing things. Uh, and in the places I work and the people I work with, there is a real, particularly with non-Indigenous people, um, there is a real goodwill and a real uh, want to connect, to hand over that power. Uh, and so that's, I think, is the, 
that's the that's the that's the bit we're all at is how do we do that how do we move from you know these this goodwill or these strategies into the doing um and how do we uh work together to maybe shift that balance of power thank you how's our time going yeah another 10 minutes or so um just so we all do understand this that the use of fire is so much more than lighting a match um what can can any of you talk a little bit to the knowledge behind it like what is the right time what is right fire for the right country in in the system in which you know it are any of you able to sort of explain um the complexity not explain exactly the complexity but just how complex it is is it site dependent on site by site or um is there a fairly ubiquitous across the country sort of understanding of how to burn anybody able to speak to that <laughs> i'm waiting for you on <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, you could comment, Unc, but yeah, I'll follow you if you like. <laughs> All right. Um, I look, one of the things we need to be really careful of is, and not that we could explain it in 10, eight minutes, Nikki, it, it is comp complex, but is that it's, it's the knowledge of First Nations peoples and um, there's a bit of a history of knowledge getting flogged and taken on by other people, including fire knowledge around the country. So um, if I could explain it in eight minutes, would I, to your audience? I'm not sure that I would um, for, for obvious reasons, but it is complex. It revolves around observing country and understanding country and often observing country for a long time before you do anything. And, um, uh, and there are, often indicators within country, it might be the flowering of a certain plant, it might be the dryness of the grass tussocks, it, you know, it's stuff like that, that will indicate when country is, is ready to burn. And as much as that, the country that surrounds it, that's not ready to burn, so you know you can do it in a safe way. So it's about reading country, it's about reading what the animals are doing. And um, uh, yeah, I guess that's all I'll say, you, you, you go. No, look, you hit the nail right on there, Dunk. I, yeah, I uh, agree with you 100%. But um, look, country, uh, country's sick, you know what I mean? And country tells us when it's time to burn. Just to add to what uh, Jack said, because it's uh, what he said is exactly right. You know, we, we burn uh, for the environment, we burn for our animals, we burn for our country. The country will tell us when that it's the right time to burn yeah so but jack jack yeah for, for me jack just answered the that question exactly <laughs> so there's been thank you both there's been a couple of questions around how does anybody else get to be involved how do we how do we support you burning on country? How do we come with you? How do we walk with you? Maddie, if you didn't want to start this one, Unc, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, exactly the way we, we did it with both TO mobs um, and Trust for Nature, Nikki, you, you know, um, do the training together, upskill our youth coming through, upskill our, our uh, you know, our, our elders as well. You know, I think, but it's got to be done, you know, um, with agencies that are, are prepared to walk side by side and listen. That You know, that's the our, you know. Um, that, that, that's the only way that it'll work best for. But I, I can't... I just want to add, sorry, I can't speak for all mobs because all mobs have different, um, you know, different um, ways of, of of caring for country and approach of where they want to care for country. But here on Bangarang country, the best way is the way that Trust for Nature um, 
had taken a stance and 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 uh, was um, 100% keen to listen to traditional owners, to work with traditional owners, and walk side by side with traditional owners. That's that's the how for me. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll add to that as well. I think um, I really answering that really depends on on who I'm answering that to. Uh, everybody has a different sphere of influence, and everybody has a different role uh, in society. And so, maybe thinking about your own sphere of influence, and you know, whether it's having a couple with people and just talking about these things, um, is is really important. I think normalizing these discussions is really important uh having things like today is really important uh I also like I said um in my yarn about getting to know the country that you're on or the country that you spend time with uh also getting to know who those traditional owners are and what they're putting out there there's so much content that traditional owners are publishing and sharing uh that's you know, on, on their websites, on YouTube, on all these different types of places. So I'd familiarize yourself with that content. Some traditional owners have documents called healthy country plans or sort of country strat strategic documents. Read those, see how you can in your sphere of influence, it could be your front garden. Um, it could be your land care group, however that is. How can you help enact those goals? How can you, you know, shift your work in ways that works towards the goals of traditional owners. Can, can I just add one thing too? Um, getting, in, getting involved, reaching out to your local mob is deadly and so needed, but also and the core pillars of my culture are patience, tolerance and respect, right? You're going to have to be patient because, you know, Uncle Dozer probably watches the footy too on the weekends. He's not sitting around his phone waiting for you to call him. We, we're we not necessarily in positions everywhere to respond to every request to be involved. Um, and that's something that might need to come first for certain bits of country, for certain mobs, is that um, mobs need to have the opportunities to be in positions to deal with all the requests that are made of mobs um, to engage on this and that um, before, you know, we're on your pace with a, a stick and lighten up, you know, like it, sometimes it's just a bit of patience and cool your jets because it, caring for country is very important to us. It is the core tenet of our culture, um, but there ain't so many of us everywhere. Yeah, thank you, Jack. And as you said earlier, it is your knowledge. Thank you everyone for questions that's all we've got time for tonight i'd like to remind you that this is part of the nature festival that delph has put on which finishes on september 25th and i encourage you all to have a look at all the other events in the nature festival um, in the chat uh, there's another link to another burn project here in the northeast um, that Sue Brunstall's put up. It's well worth a look at as well, a wonderful project. I would like to conclude that without the hard work and dedication of people like Maddie, Jack and Uncle Dozer, that Aboriginal voices would still be silent and their insights into land management would go unheard and undone on country. So I thank our three guest speakers, both for their work and for speaking to us tonight. I also thank you, our wonderful listeners, for attending tonight. And I hope you've enjoyed this webinar as much as I have. Um, and hopefully you're more inspired to do more in this space. And thank you, everybody. And good night. <laughs>